you have a choice. Dot com, the Republican candidate I did for not governor. have sexual relations. And I realize that this is something we are not going to be able to solve our problems if we get distracted by sideshows and carnival barbers. One Republican, one Democrat, and you discuss the issues that matter in today's local, state, national, and global politics. Hosted by Steve Hickson with co-hosts John Stanberry and Franklin Chansey. This is Backfire. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to another day of Backfire. Welcome, John Stanberry and Franklin Chansey. Good morning. Hey, Steve. <clears throat> Hello. How's everybody? What an exciting week in the news we've had this week. I just, you know, I appreciate Cleveland more every day. <laughs> Cleveland, we did have a shooting the other night, but... Uh, uh, Yesterday was it? Okay. Yes, now he said and a stabbing yesterday. A, and, oh, and a stabbing. Okay, that's right. We had we did have a shooting and a stabbing. I'm assuming that's not the part you were appreciating. <laughs> I'm thinking that's contrary. <laughs> I don't know where to start with uh, what's going on in in our country right now, but I think we're going to have to start with this Ferguson uh, incident to, before we can do anything else. Uh, uh, anyway, I just I don't know um, what's your opinion of. The way things have been handled so far, I'll just leave that as an open question. Go ahead. Any. Well, I think it's been handled poorly, not handled in a way that's designed to generate confidence or designed to um, to really help lessen tensions, I would say. Um, I thought it was a rather strange thing the other night to have that press conference at 9 o'clock at night uh, as opposed to earlier in the day. I thought it was awfully strange to announce After the fact and to announce hours in advance that you're going to have the preference conference at nine o'clock to give people an opportunity to gather together f- for it. That just seemed to me to be a prescription for disaster. I, it seems well, to me like it should have been done um, relatively impromptu earlier in the afternoon because I understand that those results were released by the grand jury about two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, I know the family was notified several hours before, but yeah. I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm not going to second guess the guys. I mean, they they've been dealing with first off the protest. A lot of them, not just Ferguson, but all over the country, were organized, and they were organized and and I don't mean the word infiltrated in a, in a completely nefarious way but you had the council of american islamic relations involved you had all kinds of groups involved you had uh, black panther party members that were arrested at the end of the week uh, trying to buy materials for a pipe bomb to blow up the st louis arch so i don't want to second guess them or what they're doing perhaps he thought people have a natural uh, tendency to want to go to bed so if I start this later, maybe it won't go on. You know, if I start at three o'clock in the afternoon, they got all day to tear things up. I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> I just thought <clears throat> one of the things I think I think President Obama could have given a speech days before, trying to keep uh, these things from happening. Uh, you know, his speech was good. I'm glad he did yeah, his speech. I, I wanted to say, I've been critical of him and Eric Holder for, I think, ginning this up a little bit early on, but I thought his speech the other night was generally a pretty good speech. It, uh, You know, he needed to speak, but I just think that if he had done this before the results had came to try to help ease the tension, to try to get the crowd to disperse, you know, uh, the facts are the facts. Franklin, you're in the business of law. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, is that not was it not handled properly? Well, I'm speaking as a lawyer here. Okay, okay? it was handled in an odd way. <clears throat> Why was that's it handled not in usually an odd? how grand juries are, are handled. Well, that's, that's not the norm. The, uh, the prosecutor usually presents this to a grand jury, right? Well, actually, he doesn't have to. He could have summarily made this decision himself. Well, I know. and But I think what the deal was is he did, didn't see any anything of guilt there. So he, he, he gave all the evidence to them and let them make their own decision. So he well, wouldn't well, be biased. Well, that, first of all, that's something of a misnomer. By definition in a grand jury, the grand jury is not hearing necessarily any objective person on the other side of a conflict it's only one side that's presenting the evidence but what so side that's a diff- but, so i know that's but a what different side thing. huh but what side in this case yeah it was the prosecution side what i'm telling you the way a grand jury I, I understand, ordinarily but my operates, point is okay? if you're looking at this from the standpoint of of let's say the 
people in Ferguson and the people in the country who think the officer should have been charged. Mm -hmm. It was actually a biased presentation against the officer because the prosecutor is there to present the evidence to ask for a charge, to ask for a... Well, that's the point. I, I rather doubt that the prosecutor did ask for a charge, number one. I don't think that occurred. And that's what's different about this. Usually, I'm not going to say every time, but usually. Well, would he have asked for a charge against him? Well, he gave five charges to him no, to he, consider. He, well, but that's not typically what happens, though. Typically, officer uh, DAs <coughs> go in, they present evidence. Usually, it's through one or two witnesses only, typically. And usually, uh, and frequently, I'll say, DAs do make recommendations to grand juries. Grand juries ask for recommendations and sometimes. I'm not saying that the decision was bad in this particular case. When I heard the evidence that they talked about, I was not surprised that there was not an indictment for murder. Okay, I think there was probably a legitimate question about whether a charge known as manslaughter would have typically been brought or not because of some interesting facts that the prosecutor talked about. Um, primarily the fact that, that, that uh, the last shots fired uh, in this case were, I think they said, 140 feet away from the patrol car in the case. Well, they, so that didn't they, sound quite as, a, as aggressive toward the officer as I had assumed it was initially. I had assumed it was much closer to the patrol car. Um, but he, so he, in I, his not, testimony, though, again, he said, I'm, my job is to follow the, the mm -hmm. uh, defendant and f make sure I keep up with where he's going. Well, uh, okay. I, I, I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you that I, I'm somewhat surprised that what, what prosecutors frequently do in these kinds of cases, and, I, and not necessarily something as high profile as this one, but when there's interesting facts like that, the position that a prosecutor will frequently take is, well, then I, I want there to be a trial and let a jury decide this question. Okay? So that's the unusual part about the case. I'm not saying that the decision to not indict him was wrong. Those 12 people, I'm sure, did the best job they could, and I'm not criticizing them for it. I'm just saying the whole process was just weird and different. And I but, think most lawyers who look at it would look at it but, that way. But would you admit that faced with the circumstances that this prosecutor was faced with, he was going to be criticized no matter what he did? Um, not necessarily, because I think that one of the options available to him, and we've seen it many times on the local level here in this type of situation where it involved a local official, is that the local prosecutor step out and ask an independent person to come in and do that. Well, that would have been the easy way to do that's it, I a, think. That's usually a prominent official that everybody knows and that the prosecutor no, may or I've, may I've not seen have it some. Done, I've seen it done in lo with local police officers, too. Uh, well, the only yeah, reason this, uh, this guy was supposedly should have done that is because his father was killed in the line of duty. And apparently, uh, you can't I, be objective. Look, Look, what, here's what my problem. What we're, with it. what we're talking about is, an, you asked me a question: What could he have done from an appearance standpoint that would have freed him from criticism? That was the question. He, here's my. I'll, I'll give you an example of why I think he was criticized, no matter what. Here, here's a screenshot of uh, CNN commentator Chris Cuomo. He took a picture of a protester holding a sign up that says Robert McCulloch is a damn liar. Okay. Now, there's two misspelled words on the sign. Chris Cuomo was immediately attacked as flaming racism because he posted a here, – here's one of the first uh, posts b below that. It said, Chris Cuomo, let's fan the racial flames by posting a black man who can't spell. Brilliant. Chris, Chris Cuomo pulled it down and apologized. Now, all he said, the only reason I posted it was to show that, hey, there were protests going on in Ferguson. He posted this in real time. But he was immediately called a racist because he posted a sign that had a misspelled <clears throat> word on it. Let me, let, me, let me change the tone here just a little bit. I mean, I, I wasn't that familiar with that many racial problems going on in America. Mm-hmm. I mean, do we really have a racial problem? Oh, in some in some urban communities, sure. There's a there's a real. It doesn't have to be overt racism, but there is, without question, in some parts of the country, uh, a real bias built into the criminal justice system, and it does have an inordinate effect on those communities. And like so you're it or not, they're victimized no. worse by it. 
I would say that the criminal justice system in large part has created circumstances where there's a much like greater likelihood of an African-American male in particular getting a longer sentence for the same conduct well, that would be performed by a Caucasian person and it having a disparate, disparate impact on those communities. Well, let, yes, let me, I would say that. Just for balance, let me just give a couple of little odd statistics here. Uh, according to the 2010 National Crime Victimization Survey done by the Bureau of Justice Statistics under the U.S. Department of Justice, 2010, 62,593 blacks were the victim of white violence. That same year, 320,082 whites were the victims of black violence. So 62,000 to 320,000. The young black males that Franklin references, young black males of a specific age make up about 1% of the population, but they account for 27% of the murders. Well, first of all, I wouldn't really be referencing violent crimes. That's a different category. What I will tell murders. what I will tell what I will tell you twenty seven percent of the murders, one percent of the population. What I will tell you is if you're an African American male and you get arrested, for example, for marijuana possession, nationwide, you've got about a sixty percent higher chance of spending <coughs> more time in jail than if you were not. That's the kind of thing that does I'm talking have, about. Does it have anything to do with past records? Sometimes it does, I mean, but not always. I mean, in other words, if, look, if look, a white been, person and all, a black there, person there been all kinds were arrested studies. for the first time for a joint of marijuana, they're going to get more time? Statistically speaking, yes. Well, wait a minute. What he's asking for is if you control for previous record. Now, I'm not, look, no. I won't disagree with Franklin. I, I, I have a pretty much zero tolerance for all of this stuff. And yeah. so if you're black or white and you've got crack cocaine, yeah. I think you ought to be arrested. I right. think you ought to be prosecuted and you ought to be sent to jail for the same amount of time. So I don't disagree. But a lot of times the statistics that the liberals use in this and that some of the civil rights organizations use, they don't account for other things like you're talking about, Steve. They don't account for previous records. For, for, for example, you know, we have a lot of legislatures, and this wouldn't just apply to Republicans. This would apply to Democrats, too, who have passed a lot of let's get tough on crime laws. Yeah. Okay. But one of the things they'll do is pass these things called mandatory minimums. And for many, many years, particularly in the federal system, there was dramatically more jail time associated with crack cocaine than powdered cocaine. Well, powdered cocaine was more expensive. Consequently, you tend to see that in people who had more money than the folks who were using crack cocaine, which was a little much less expensive. The people who Are used crack the cocaine, same thing? Would, they're not no. the same thing, but they have they're not a very similar effect. Okay, but let me let me. Uh, let but me. hold on. Right. But you would get sometimes five, six, seven, eight, ten times as much jail time for the fact that it was crack cocaine. Was that because it? I mean, it was a, a habit-forming drug. No, they're they're both, both habit-forming. Both. Let, let, let me throw one wrinkle in that, though, Frank. And look, and again, I don't disagree. I think those, those crimes ought to be across the board equal. But here's one problem. At the same time politicians are being criticized for that, the crack cocaine epidemic was devastating the black and, and, and the minority community, whereas the powder cocaine, while it's, I'm not defending it, most of those people were still functioning in society. So at the same time, if a politician didn't uh, center on crack cocaine, which was devastating black communities, he was then accused of not helping to build up the black community and not protecting the minority community. So the, the impact of crack cocaine is actually much more damaging than the impact of the powdered cocaine. And I'm sure on the surface, when the legislators did that, that was probably the reason for those differences. I don't think anybody sat down and said, oh, look, whites use powder cocaine, blacks use crack cocaine, let's give a heavier sentence to the crack cocaine. I don't think there was racism involved. And that's one of the problems with this whole approach by this Justice Department and, quite frankly, this president and a lot of the liberals is they look on the back end, like I said, 1% of the population, young black males, 27% of the murders. Well, then they'll come along and go, look, there's too many black males in prison for murder. Well, perhaps that's because they commit more of the murders. Well, there, there really has not been a, lo a rush to complain about prosecutions of murders. I, I'm, but this, my, that's there has the been, a, there has been a, a, a stark difference in the way we've treated drug offenses and so forth. Well, I understand that there is a problem with 
so many blacks in our prison systems right now. But most of it is is I, I don't think it's a it's a racial issue. I think it's just a, a I well, think it's an issue within. Well, tell me about the black businesses in Ferguson uh, that were burned to the oh, ground and ridiculous. looted. You know, what killed me is you still, I, I watched reporters stand there and go, these protesters are upset about this verdict as they're walking out of stores with ham stuffed in their pants and bottles of liquor <laughs> stuffed in their pants, and they completely cleaned out the woman with the hair extension uh, business. Yeah. You tell me how walking out with a hair extension in no, your hand no, or walking out with no, a ham in your pants has anything no, to do no, with racism. No, but nobody's saying anything in defense of those looters nobody i didn't heard a single person say anything well brown's they father be, was shouting to the crowd burn this at, down actually michael brown's family's now, statement they gave was it was, was it was asked excellent. for peace but did you and made see, a very constructive suggestion. you're absolutely right yeah. but did you see his performance out in the crowd no i did not see he, he was standing up on the side of a car oh, chanting and over and over down. again burn this b-i-t-c-h down yeah and, you know that's a sad thing i, I will that. say this he, they had a, a cousin or a nephew of Michael Brown on, who apparently lives in Los Angeles, I believe. Hannity had him on. I actually thought he was very balanced. He was obviously supporting the family and supporting the idea that they felt like charges should. But he said, you know, look, there's there's si both sides to look at this. Feel free to Google Kevin Hart, the comedian Kevin Hart's statement on Twitter over this, was actually very balanced. And he said, look, not all cops are bad. Not all black people are, are criminals. It, it was a pretty balanced statement. So maybe we can get some with this. I personally, though, don't like the fact that Eric Holder came back in and said, oh, by the way, we cooperated, but our investigation is completely separate, well, and we're separate. still looking at, at the racial side of this. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that race played a factor in Officer um, well, that was Wilson's going to be, that, that actions. Well, that was going to be one of my questions, is why Eric Holder went there to start with. Well, it seems to me that it helped calm down the violence that he went there that that i think it could have calmed down the violence if uh, obama just made a speech at the time himself it would have done just as much or more i think my problem was and, and even some more liberal media outlets have said he he went there and appeared to take sides well that's i think not, he shouldn't not, have done that's that. not the the impression that the prosecutor had the other night he was very complimentary of, the of course Department. he was complimentary franklin on tv <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> well, it's not a Democrat who who, who was up well, there giving this, that press conference. This administration you know? has showed a viciousness in going after anybody that opposes them. If I was that prosecutor, <laughs> I would have been complimentary on the news as well. <laughs> the IRS is probably getting ready to investigate him as we speak. But why is he having his own investigation, Eric Holder? Because... Well, first of all, the state officials in Missouri ask for some involvement on the federal level to help calm down what was going on there. And, uh, and the decision that the prosecutor made, and this is where we'll go back to where I think he made a mistake, it would have been very easy at that point for him to ask for an independent prosecutor to be appointed, Frankly, and he would I have been free Eric from any. Holder in what? this, no. especially in this. It wouldn't situation. have been Eric Holder. It would have been somebody from the state of Missouri. I wouldn't That's trust that governor either. He picked what? sides from the get go as well. Well, I mean, you know, let me, here, here, let me pose here, 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 a broader here, here, question. No, wait, let me pose a broader here, 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 question. Here, 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 let, let me, How do you get a police get, officer to do their job let's get the, let's when you get treat the them like this? Let's get the background here of where this happened. Apparently, in this police department. Over the last five years, there have been five shootings involving police officers and unarmed black men. Unarmed, okay? In none of those cases were any charges brought. That creates a dynamic where there's a degree of skepticism about whether justice is being provided on an even-handed basis or not. I'd just say it's a lot, hard, it's a lot more difficult circumstance to evaluate than we get watching the media in this case i, I fully get that and I, it's the reason i'm not totally i'm not really criticizing the prosecutor in terms of his actual prosecutorial decisions 
I'm only criticizing him about process here because I think he could. You think he did a good job explaining when he made the, when he I thought he, came I thought he did. I thought job. he did a reasonable job with that. Yeah, I thought Just he did an excellent. Job, I, did, I thought, I thought he, did he did. He went out of I, his I way. I mean, you know, it's difficult for me to <clears throat> not be a lawyer when I listen to that. So when I look, when I listen to it, I'm listening to things that that raise questions in my mind. What raised questions in your mind? The number one thing was the was that the, the the coroner and all of the autopsy results agreed apparently that the last shot that was fired was was the one that went through the top of Mr. Ferguson's head. They thought that would have killed him instantly, so that that had to be the last one is what they concluded. And that was about 140 feet from the patrol car. Well, he well, was a, he was his, not he was not next to the patrol car when he shot him, was he? Yes, the first shot was the fired. first shot was well, in the car. In the car, but then he got but, out and pursued, which and is left. what we pay police officers to do. The the question is at that point. The, it, there's a legitimate question here about what transpired at that point. Well, actually, and that's there's what, what six or eight witnesses that said he put his head down, which in, in, in explains the top of the head, okay. and he charged him like a football linebacker. Okay. That's black but, but, but this, witnesses. But this, you know, I'm just playing devil's advocate here, okay? At that point, we know that he'd been shot about seven times at this point. But he was still So his, he bent his head down. I don't know what his condition was at that point. Well, Franklin, okay. let me ask you two. Let me Here's ask two the, devil's no, advocate on, questions. On. Here's what I'm saying to you, John. This is where you get to the point where you ask yourself: Would it be better that a cross section of citizens and jurors then ultimately made that decision at that point? A real jury I, in a real trial for both for, sides for the people? justice system and for asking officers to go out every day mm-hmm. and risk their lives? No, I don't wouldn't. agree either. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the car's driver's side window was shattered. And the driver's side mirror was bent towards the car, possibly indicating evidence of a fierce struggle between Wilson and Brown while the officer was still seated in his patrol car. I don't think there's any question that well, that Michael Brown has some responsibility for. Now we saw we a, saw the we saw the guy in the convenience store. Mm-hmm. I mean, national television picked that up. Mm-hmm. The guy wasn't acting normal to me. I think Well he I'm, had marijuana the autopsy also shows he had marijuana in his system. Well, you know what? Marijuana usually is a calming effect. I think he was wound up on something else that hadn't even came out yet. Well, let me ask you a a hypothetical, Franklin. Mm -hmm. What if the officer had not followed him and he had gone into the housing project where he was headed and he killed some black citizens of the housing project? Would the officer have then been subject to how could you have let this hardened criminal go and not protect you you didn't care okay, about well, the black citizens well, well, for, well, first, of the housing well, first project. of all one of the other things that came out in the press conference was that the entire transaction of events happened in 90 seconds right. so it's not like you know there was a, a long pause also which means within, 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 as i recall and, and, and i could be wrong about this but my recollection is that his backup got there about a minute later. Right. So it's it's not like but Frank, Mr. Brown was out of sight that? Here. He was doing his job. Well, he was doing his job efficiently and trying to make sure that he protected the community from a criminal. Well, we still had an unarmed individual. Uh, actually, no, you didn't, Franklin. Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, he was a Franklin, lot larger. What's the smallest girl? Well, the officer, the officer, it turns out, is almost as tall and 210 pounds himself. What's he was no the small smallest guy. girlfriend you've ever dated, Franklin? Just size-wise. Give me a ballpark. 95 pounds. 95 pounds. How much did Michael Brown weigh? 240. Is that what it was? I, I thought he was, uh, yeah, he was approaching 300 pounds. So if I, I don't know. if Michael he's Brown a big guy. he's a big guy if There's Michael no Brown comes up against your ninety pound former girlfriend is he unarmed? Well, is he unarmed? If my former girlfriend were an army ranger, it, it might be a, a subject to d- debate. If I was a trained police officer, it might be a subject to debate. I don't know the answer. Franklin, incident, the fact that you don't have a gun or a knife does not mean you're unarmed. And if you read Officer Wilson's testimony, he stuck his right hand in the waistband of his pants. Now, I actually thought Megan Kelly made a really good point in one of her discussions on this. She said law enforcement officers are not required to lose their life in the in the action of their job I, I think the issue here is there's a rather unique law in missouri that has some impact on this case 
and and that law there allows a police officer to shoot a fleeing felon. But, this, but he wasn't armed. fleeing. He was he was approaching. Well, he clearly he did try to he, flee. He did, yeah, But exactly. then he stopped and turned exactly. around and came but, back. But you know, Wilson, um, well, Officer Wilson shot. The first three shots were in his hand, if I'm not mistaken. At least they knew at least, at least one. one of them was. And there was blood inside the car. We know there right. were ten shots <clears throat> fired. By the way, Franklin, 105 officers were killed in 2013 in the line of duty. Okay. How do you ask an officer, hey, listen, we want you to always give the benefit of the doubt at the risk of your own life to the criminal that you already know strong arm, you know, robbed this store down the way and has now battered you inside your patrol car. But at that point, you still owe him the risk of your life for his benefit. Unfortunately, we call on police officers to do exactly that. Well, that's which a is, which is, No, which, we do not. We exercise call, their judgment. Yeah. That's what we ask not, them to do. Not when they have to put more protection on the criminal's life than on their own. Because, Franklin, if you go down that road long enough, you won't be able to pay a police officer enough money to do that job. Uh, witness number 44 said that uh, Brown charged at Wilson even after Wilson's fired his gun the cop just stood there the ent- and the witness said dang if the kid didn't start running right at the cop like a football player head down i heard three bangs but the big kid wouldn't stop mm-hmm. uh then it goes on and talks about uh, wilson made a comment here when he was testifying he looked up at me and he had the most intense aggressive face it looked he it looked like a demon. That's how angry he looked. Well, actually, I'm glad you read that because now the civil rights people are saying the fact that Wilson used the word demon indicates racism. Oh, and that that's a reason that Eric – now, look, Eric Holder that's being – That's the same – that's, that's roughly the similar description that the officers gave to about Rodney King, if you'll recall. That's why that became an issue. How long was Rodney King kicked and beaten? Oh, a couple of minutes. No, it was 40, I believe, either 45 or 49 seconds. Now, the loop the, that the, the news the point, the point, ran the point, on TV the point being, though, showed John, it. He was oh, on the ground, not but, charging somebody. He actually wasn't obeying what they were telling him to do. I'm not defending what yeah. they did, but my point is the media took that, put it in a loop, and ran it over and over again. And when you went out and they asked people well, well, in the community well, how long was well, he beat, they went five or ten well, minutes. Let's talk about something constructive then, okay? This suggestion – that all communities invest in body cameras. I, I don't have a problem with the body camera. I think it's a great idea. I don't idea. either. That's a, a great cost, idea. and I hate that it is a cost. it's another expense. But it seems to me that sure have a prevent a lot of problems you know, like this. You know something, Franklin? Mm-hmm. I think it would be dollars well spent when you have this kind of ridiculous stuff going well, on. Well, here's the real problem. Now, here's, for the- here's what's going to aggravate John and I really bad, is when all this looting's over with and this whole thing calmed down, they're going to want to send some money up there to fix everything. Well, let me read. The, the, I, I want I want to give you all a name, and you all should go online and find this lady. She was interviewed on Fox Business, Natalie uh, Dubose, and she runs a bakery in, in there. They broke her window down, tore her business up, and they did an interview with her, and she was incredibly poised and and just elegant in her response and she just said look i've got thanksgiving day orders to do she said i've got to see if i can buy the material that they tore up back and i've got deliveries to make and they said well you know what how far behind she said well i'm at least a day behind to clean up my shop and i will now be delivering on thanksgiving day but you all should try to find her it's natalie's cakes and more (coughs) she has a facebook page she was incredibly gracious and and just sort of the american business spirit and when you look at her she's the victim of this where, where is the president talking about her where is uh al sharpton complaining about the damage to this young black woman's business who did nothing wrong in any of this one of the things i was going to say about eric holder if he had been called in and he was solely investigating the ferguson and the st louis police department for racial disparity i'm okay with that because that is under the purview of what the Justice Department is supposed to be doing. I personally don't have any faith in Eric Holder being objective about it, but it is his job. 
But the problem is he's not talking about that. He's talking about this individual officer's case, and that is a completely different situation. I agree. Let's take a break. We'll open up the lines when we come back. Take calls. Bye-bye. You're listening to Backfire with Steve Hickson. We'll be right back after this. You are listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Check into Check into Cash. Turn your car into cash at Check into Cash. Get an auto title loan today for up to $2,500. At Check into Cash, you get the most for your car, and we make it quick, easy, and confidential. Stop in for an auto title loan today or a payday advance for up to $425. Call toll free 877 262 Cash. Title loan amount determined by value of car and ability to repay. Borrowers often use payday advances over a period of months, which can be expensive. Restrictions apply. See store for details. Did you know that U.S. Money Shops cashes all checks, even the ones most check cashers reject? Tax refund checks, government checks, payroll checks, and many more. And when you cash a check with U.S. Money Shops, we'll give you 10% off your next purchase. At U.S. Money Shops, we have everything you need at a fraction of regular retail. So stop by one of our 11 locations or visit us online at usmoneyshops.com. Buy yourself a coin today, the better way at U.S. Money Shops. Some restrictions may apply. See store for details. If you need a little green, Lending Frog is making deals. He'll lend you cash on any kind of wheels. Borrow just a little, or you can borrow big. Lending Frog is a new financial gig. It's hip to hop, it's hip to hop into cash. LendingFrog.com is making a splash. Take it, take it. Coach to Coach is sponsored by two great Cleveland, Tennessee institutions. Check into Cash, founded in 1993, the pioneer of payday advances, and Hardwick Clothes, founded in 1880. Visit checkintocash.com to explore our micro lending products, including installment and title loans. Hardwick.com, America's oldest tailored clothing maker, offers made in America quality suits and blazers. Visit us online and support two Tennessee legends. Hello, my name is Andy Figglestaller with Ed Jacobs & Associates. We are an employee benefit and insurance broker in business for the past 20 years. The new health care law, also known as Obamacare, has finally arrived. The law is complex and the choices are confusing. You have questions, we have the answers. It is our passion to find cost-effective solutions for every client. The solutions will be different for every person or business. Let our knowledge, experience, and passion go to work for you. Contact us today and let us assist you through this process. Our phone number is 423-473-0202, or you can find us on the web at edjacobs.com. Dr. Christopher Chase with Associates in Plastic Surgery now offers his patients the convenience of a Cleveland office at 2350 North Okoy Street. Dr. Chase specializes for the ladies in breast augmentation, including lifts, reconstructions, and reductions. Also, tummy tucks or mommy makeovers and facial rejuvenation, including facelifts, eyelids, brows, nose, and he also offers Botox procedures. Check out Dr. Christopher Chase. He is certified by the American American Board of Surgery, the American Board of Plastic Surgery. He's a member of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons and the American Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Check their website out at APRS.MD. That's APRS.MD. Call for your convenient appointment in Cleveland at 624-0021. 2350 North Okoy. That's Dr. Christopher Chase. If you're looking for a home, apartment, or office space, Jones Properties provides residential and commercial properties in the heart of the Southeast that will fulfill any need. Plus, Jones Properties is one of the fastest growing firms in the area, which offers you more security. When you're ready for a home, apartment, or in need for commercial office space, it makes sense to call Jones Properties first at 472-4000. Plus, you can get additional information by logging on to the website at triple 
www.jonesproperties.biz. Jones Properties is also looking to invest in properties. So if you have a property that you need to sell, call the professional team at Jones Properties first. They'll help you find the perfect property for whatever your needs. Call today, 472-4000. And don't forget to keep up with Jones Properties on Facebook. You're listening to Backfire with Steve Hickson on Woof FM. Call 423-614-5553 to join in on the conversation. Now, back to Backfire. All right, we're back live in the studio. And uh, uh, phone lines are open. If you want to give us a call, we'll talk about anything you want to talk about. But uh, what about, uh, let's change uh, change our tone just a little bit I, we could go on and on and on about what's going on in ferguson i think but it, uh, it's all over the news and i'm sure you're going to get uh, all you want of that but uh, uh there was a senator chuck schumer uh that brought out some comments about obamacare focused on the wrong problems and ignored the middle class they said they shouldn't have they shouldn't have pushed it through the Democrats shouldn't have. That <clears throat> they had their opportunity to help the economy, and uh, that people didn't really care about the Obamacare thing. That it helped a small group of people, but it really didn't help the vast majority. And that they blew their mandate. Mm-hmm. Uh, he went on to say that Americans were crying out for an end to the recession, better wages, and uh, more jobs, not changes in health care. Um, well, Chuck's a little <laughs> slow to the party, but he, I'm glad he went on to say, "I wish Obama cared more about helping Democrats other than sick people." <laughs> Did he say that? Yeah, I mean, there it is. But uh, well, uh, notice he didn't say that Obamacare was a bad idea. He, he said did. they made a mistake pushing. It at the time they well, did. He, he said that the he, public didn't really care about it, and that it helped a very small section of the people. And even that's in question now. Uh. <laughs> anyway, uh, what about uh, Chuck Cagle? Our, uh, what's his title again? Secretary of well, Defense. Now his title's I Was Fired. Yeah, now his title I Was Fired. Now, now, John, everybody says he resigned. He was fired. <laughs> what do you think he was fired over? Well, there's two, there's two different uh, kind of concepts on why he was fired uh senator mccain says that mccain i think is probably trying to help his friend hagel save a little dignity he says hagel this is a quote from mccain was frustrated with aspects of the administration's national security policy and decision making process uh that he excited excessive uh micromanagement on the part of the white house um, and, you know, Robert Gates and Leon Panetta, former uh, defense secretaries as well, have both said the same thing in their memoirs recently. But there are other sources that say that he was dragging his feet on signing off on releasing more Gitmo detainees, that there was a real content. Apparently, he has to actually sign off on them. And even though he did sign off on the Bergdahl ones, he has since then, for apparently several months, refused to sign off on a bunch at the point where uh, last May Rice sent Hagel a memo directing him to report to her every two weeks on the progress transferring or releasing Gitmo prisoners. Uh, so there's some indication that it was over. He, he wouldn't do what the White House wanted him to do on Gitmo. Most of the analysis has involved the implementation of the policy in the Middle East right now the ISIS conflict well, not and that he was not particularly a strong advocate for a more aggressive uh, uh, Department of Defense. Well, actually, the, the real comment was that they got mad at him in September when he gave a statement where he said ISIS uh, was an imminent threat to U.S. interests, that that was, I guess, the straw that broke the camel's back. Now, the real problem here is that they've all, uh, Washington Post and all of them have said, look, nothing's going to change because Hagel really wasn't in charge anyway, that the White House is micromanaging uh, the Department of Defense from the White House and that there's a group of advisors that sort of set the tone and that that's been the problem to the point where Dana Milbank, who's a liberal Washington Post columnist, uh, tweeted, any theories on why Obama commands so little loyalty from the likes of Panetta, Gates, Clinton? (laughs) 
What do you think is going to happen with Gruber? Is he going to be able to testify? I understood he agreed to testify. <clears throat> oh, by the way, they found another video of him talking about how abortion is actually a benefit to society and helps minority communities by willowing out bad genetic uh, combinations. Now think about that for a minute. Okay. Sounds a lot like the same thing that Planned Parenthood was founded on, that the blacks were a minority, I, I, a mongrel I wonder, race. I wonder why Mitt Romney hired him then. Well, you know what, Franklin? Mitt Romney, I hate to break this to you. I've told you this over and over again. Wasn't my first choice. You Too good for him. Well, he was better than what we got, but that's not yeah, saying anything. We, but, we've got now liberals and conservatives saying Obama will, has now surpassed Jimmy Carter as the worst president in history. So comparing Mitt Romney to Obama is a pretty easy comparison. <laughs> economy posts even stronger growth, reported in the paper Frankly, today. you better talk to the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times and the uh, Washington Post. Every, eco they every all major economy the in, the, in the country, in the world, uh, amongst the, uh, the democracies, are in recession. Ours is growing. Frankly, Terrible it's job. the longest Terrible and the job. worst recovery from a recession in the history of the country. Terrible what, job. What's going to happen, Franklin, when the interest rate gets up to 4, 5, 6%, where it should be? What do you think is going to happen? Well... That won't happen unless the economy continues to grow at a sustained pace. If it does, then it'll be good for everybody. Well, uh, what's going to happen when these uh, five million new immigrants start competing for the jobs that the already depressed most black e most most economists Actually, say that it's going to be a boost to the economy? Me tell me one. <laughs> I tell you what, John, we'll come in next week and we'll bring those articles. Well, actually, I've got it right now, frankly. <laughs> You're looking at an article. Obama's that amnesty will cost $22,000 per U.S. college grad. What? $22,000 for every four-year college degree. Yeah, That's just putting the $2 trillion or roughly $40 billion a year cost for the next five years what on. Do, what does a college degree contribute back into the economy, John? Franklin, the point is a college grad will now be paying $22,000 to support the Ill illegal immigrants that the president has now green-lighted into our economy. Also, Franklin... Who are already working all, here, John. Yeah, but get, get this, Franklin. And not paying into because the system. Because he's going to give them the status you just mentioned, paying in, it means that they will also be open for the earned income tax credit. The average American citizen has about a 13% poverty rate. The average illegal immigrant population has about a 23 percent poverty rate if you factor that in you will now have earned income tax credits going to the immigrants from u.s taxpayers most people who've looked at this have said it's a win for the economy actually that's not true either my lord where are you getting your information <laughs> right now you have a huge underground economy where people are not participating in the systems, not contributing taxes, and all the other things they're doing because they're trying to stay off the grid. Those people will not be in that position anymore. Well, the head of Obama's, um, let me f make sure I get this right, uh, Council of Economic Advisors, Obama's head in 2013 admitted that the flood of new workers actually helps hold down American wages. That view was echoed in a Harvard University professor's report. He, he estimated that legal and illegal immigrants have expanded the economy by 11% or $1.6 trillion, but they received 96 7.8% of that increase in their pay packets. He, they work hard for low wages, it, which drags down the wages paid to Americans who compete against them by roughly $402 billion a year. So they're going to add a little to the economy, which is what the president's bragging on, but then they're going to take a huge chunk back. And because they're now going to have a legal status, they will be eligible for all of the benefits that taxpayers actually pay for. Uh, well, I'll say one thing. There will be some new shovel-ready jobs fixing to happen in Ferguson. Well, if you watched 60 Minutes this week, there ought to be a lot of them all over the country right now. That's really one of the most important stories that's not getting enough attention. I don't know if you saw that or not. What was it? Just how bad the condition of the nation's infrastructure is. 
uh, and how serious the threat to our economy is from it. I mean, it, it, it's literally something like 26,000 bridges are deficient at this point and uh, it, actual safety threats. Um, uh, a lot of major arteries in major cities. Uh, just Pittsburgh alone, they use that as an example because they have a lot of bridges there. They've got something like 22 bridges over rivers there that are uh, deficient in terms of the, the safety of those bridges now and the structural integrity of them. Uh, it's a huge threat to the economy nationwide. Um, well, gee, if we the fact some that we, entitlement and, and, spending, we'd have money to do those infrastructure yeah. well, here's, projects. Well, here's the thing. We haven't increased any spending for these things in over 20 years. That's because the money's all been going into entitlement programs due to the Democrat liberal progressive policies that we followed by Republicans and well, Democrats. There was, a bi- there was a bipartisan group with Republicans and Democrats that they were spending a lot of time talking to that this is their primary issue. It is. But and, they, agree, and they said that there was just a tremendous failure. The problem, Let me, in the next two decades, Franklin, Medicaid, Medicare, and Obamacare will eat up well, 75 here, cents out of well, every here, tax what dollar. I'm what about you, the EPA? Here's what I'm going to tell you for sure right now. In May of this year, the Highway Trust Fund runs out of money unless Congress acts to do something about it. Well, one of the problems, frankly, is right before Thanksgiving, the White House has now released plans for 3,415 new regulations. Um, 189 of those new rules will cost more than $100 million each. So one of the reasons these projects are so expensive is because this White House has increased the regulatory burden on American businesses and, you know, municipalities. Because the White House says, you got to make this road do this. you got to make it do that. 3,415 new fall regulations. And what they do? They dumped it right before Thanksgiving so it would all kind of be shuffled out and forgotten about. Let's take a call. Go ahead, caller. You're live. I just want to ask uh, how much or how many of those bridges that uh, we were, y'all were talking about there, how many of those bridges could be fixed if the money that has been sent to uh, rebuild the Middle East and to help those people over there that have been fighting for uh, eternity. Uh, how uh, how many of those bridges could be fixed with that money that's been sent over there? Well, you know, look, I don't disagree. Uh, you know, we might discuss whether I think... Uh, helping some of those regions protects us from just keeping them from coming after us but he's absolutely right we have to look at priorities and the problem is the progressives they will spend all this money on feel-good stuff and it's it's hard to disagree oh we want to help this group or that group but then when real things like bridges and roads come up they go oh well look we don't have enough money for that and the caller's absolutely right we need to look at all of our spending prioritize it and say where should it be spent first and I would agree with him. Before we spend, you know, millions and millions on other countries, we ought to be spending it here. We were able to build all of those roads and bridges after all the money we had spent on World War II, after providing all the money we sent to Europe under the Marshall Plan. And what was the social the welfare plan. state then? You're absolutely right, Franklin, but you're hitting on the problem. The progressives have made a welfare state that costs us more than we can afford. was in a significant budget deficit situation, and we still found the political will to do it. And it was before Johnson's Great Society expanded entitlements. And that still provided a huge economic benefit Franklin, to the country. I, I hate to break this to you, but economically, what you're talking about, you're right on the baseline, but you can't do what you all want to do. You cannot spend the money on an, an exponentially growing welfare state and have any money left over to do what we ought to be doing. 
That, but but guess what? Doing what we ought to be doing doesn't welfare, buy a Democrat The votes. welfare state you're primarily talking about is Social Security No, and it's not. Medicare, and you all do and that every time. And Medicare it and Medicaid. Not, it is welfare. Your, your, new, your president has relaxed this, the work rules. This, this, this is, this is, Bill Clinton about, actually this, this put is, work is, rules this in. Is where, let's talk this about is where Obamacare. John, this is let's talk John, about Obamacare. Let's talk about just Obamacare. All right. It just came out. You even had the Democratic senator, whatever his name is, talking about Obamacare's it. most used plans face double-digit average premium increases this year. What does it have year. to do with the welfare state? It cost us a fortune. Obamacare, in two decades, Obamacare will – will. It, you know what was really funny? The cost of Obamacare – I printed off a bar graph <laughs> last night for a group. In 2013 – the increase was X amount. Well, the increase went down in 2014. Then it went up every year for the next 20 years. Imagine John. why it went down. Why do you think it went down in 2014? Because that was an election year. So they made sure that the premiums and the costs went down the one year they needed votes, and then it goes up from there on. Right here. Americans were crying out for the end of the, of the recession for better wages. And for more jobs, not health care changes. Where did the health care come it's in? It's costing us a fortune. There's not. First of all, when you say us, you're not talking about the government, are you? I'm talking about everybody. The government, the taxes, everything, Franklin. John thinks that the health care system magically was free before Obamacare. Well, here's what it magic. was. Magic. It was magic. Well, here, 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 here you go, Franklin. It says Democrats could have passed a much less disruptive bipartisan plan to offer tax credits to the uninsured without driving up costs for everyone else. They chose not to. Forty-one percent of uninsured Americans intend to remain uninsured under you all's plan that was supposed to. So that means fifty-nine percent don't. Is that Forty-one percent right? of the uninsured, Franklin, well, not that the means, population. That means fifty-nine percent of the uninsured. Just tend sixteen. To go get just sixteen percent right? of them say the law has helped them. The number of uninsured people in Tennessee fell twenty-five percent in one year. And it all, but the bulk of it went on the back of the taxpayers. No, it was already on the back of the Franklin, taxpayers. That's where you. That's, no, you that's missed, the part you. No, no, here's what you miss when when people don't have any skin in the game then they they don't care how much something costs so what you've done is you've created a whole another group of entitlements you mean which like, are eating you us mean alive like, you mean like people who didn't care that they could just go to the emergency room Look, and get Franklin, treated without I hate paying to break anything it to you. i'm gonna give you margaret thatcher's words the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money and when you start talking it's about bridges socialism. and roads, The architect admitted it was socialism, and they hid that from the American people. All right. We're coming towards the end of the time, and we need to do something. We need to talk about being thankful. Ah. John surprises me every now and then. He he told me while we was on the break, I said, what do you want to talk about? He said, well, we need to talk about Thanksgiving. Let's be thankful. We should be thankful every day. Every day. In spite of all of our differences, we live in a wonderful country that gives us many, many benefits that a lot of places in the world don't share. And even though we have disagreements like we have here on Backfire, I'm still grateful for the opportunity to have those disagreements. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad Franklin has the opportunity because the liberal attorney representing the Republicans <laughs> in the House to me, is now <laughs> is now being told that he should have a gag order by the good progressives. But Franklin's <laughs> right. Let let me. Uh, I'm not even going to go through all of the instances where I can criticize Obama's Thanksgiving Day uh, proclamations. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would like to read you all, just so you all have some basis for Thanksgiving. This is George Washington's original proclamation. Uh, Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November, next to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being, who is the benevolent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be. Will be. Uh, 
that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks, and also that we may then unite in most humbly offering our prayers and supplications to the great Lord and ruler of nations and beseech him to pardon our national and other transgressions. George Washington. All right. Uh, Franklin, I know you got to run, but have a very happy Thanksgiving. And you as well. All right, folks, I guess we're going to end on a soft note today because it's Thanksgiving. So uh, we hope you'll have a wonderful Thanksgiving and stay tuned next week. We will be back. Bye bye. You've been listening to Backfire with Steve Hickson, John Stanberry, and Franklin Chancey. Catch them again on Whoop FM.